JavaScript, and what can you expect? Um, first, I'm going to make the appeal that you give JavaScript a chance, because there's actually an amazing lot of people who really hate JavaScript. So it's always kind of an uphill battle to explain that the language actually can be fun under the right circumstances. Uh, what I'm going to give is an overview of the language. I am not going to talk about browser uh, things like Dawn and stuff. I'm just going to concentrate on the language because the language itself is becoming increasingly more useful. Um, so for you, anytime there is something you don't understand, because I expect the level of knowledge in the audience to be mixed, uh, anytime there is something you don't understand, please ask. Et si vous voulez, vous pouvez aussi euh, demander en français. Donc, c'est plus possible. Ok, alors, me, to just put into perspective, I might just be a blind JavaScript lover, but actually, my background is pretty much in Java. I've been a programmer since 1985. I've programmed uh, Java since 1995. Um, and I've uh, programmed web applications since 1995. My first HX program I picked in 2006, and I actually started with Java over there. So uh, DWR, is anyone has anyone used it? Okay. So it's like Java, and it's actually pretty neat. Uh, but you have two different languages. You have Java on the server and JavaScript in the browser. So it's it's kind of a uh, there's a bit of a disconnect. Um, after that, I've used uh, GWT for a long time, uh, which is a very, very nice technology. So, especially because you can use Eclipse, uh, it's really, at the moment, one of the best ways of writing uh, web applications. And, but hopefully, it'll soon change, and uh, there'll be good IDEs for for JavaScript. But until that time, GWT is very appealing, and you. Same thing, you have the same language for the server and for the client, uh, and it just translates to JavaScript from the client. Um, as for you, um, who of you, uh, what's, your, what's your knowledge? Who of you uh, know Java? And, all right, so cool, that's good. So again, I'm going to refer back to Java, uh, probably a lot. Um, who has already programmed uh, JavaScript? Um, who's like uh, who? Who's done a few lines and thinks that there are like some strange parts of the language that he, uh, he or she doesn't know yet? All right. Okay. So why JavaScript? If a lot of you have already programmed JavaScript, it's probably uh, you probably already have the answer. Uh, the big one is web applications, and those have dramatically changed the language because right now, if, the, if you have a programming language that doesn't allow you to do web apps, there's one huge platform you can't deploy on. Uh, so that is tricky for uh, many of the uh, big programming languages right now. Um, then along came Node.js, which made it possible to use the same language that you use in the browser, to use that on the server. Um, so you have the same language, which is always makes things easier. Uh, you can also use Node.js for shell scripting, and you can interactively try out things, which is cool as well. So if you have libraries, you can install them via a, a very nice package manager, um, and you can even install software. So other languages have that too. For example, Python has eggs, and I think Ruby has gems. So you have that in other languages, but uh, the, the JavaScript implementation is really, really well done. Um, more and more desktop technologies are accessible via JavaScript. Uh, Windows 8, for example, uh, Qt. So uh, a lot of things are opening up. And also because JavaScript is like 
one of the few truly open languages. And you, at the moment, you have the, uh, the you have Google and Oracle fighting over with Java. So JavaScript being truly open is a big plus. Does everyone understand me? All right. um, and then you have technologies that integrate very well with uh, JavaScript. You have uh, JSON, which is well, obviously derived from JavaScript. Uh, and you have NoSQL databases, which could actually be considered JavaScript databases in, in some ways. MongoDB has a, a database shell, and that database shell is just is JavaScript. So those, there's a lot of pieces that fit together very well for JavaScript at the moment. And I think the slides are going to be online, so you, you might not have to take notes, but it's up to you. Uh, terminology, very quickly, ECMAS, uh, everyone has heard the word ECMAScript, right? Yes? And so who has heard the word ECMAScript before? So there's a lot of different words going around in the, in the JavaScript community, and the problem is that Oracle has a trademark on the word Java, which is why Microsoft doesn't say, or officially calls its JavaScript implementation JScript, because they can't call it JavaScript. So that's why a different name had to be created for the standard, and the standard name is ECMAScript, and the implementation, if you, if you can actually use it in a browser, then it's JavaScript. So the newest version of the standard is ECMAScript 5.1. Um, every now and then you hear people talk about uh, ECMAScript Next. Has anyone heard about All right. So ECMAScript Next is when people talk about the future. Uh, so that's, at the moment, the, the code name for the upcoming version of, of ECMAScript, uh, which will be finished by the end of 2013, which is fairly quickly if you compare it to how slowly uh, Java progressed for some years. Now it's getting better. Um, and you have ECMAScript 6, which is probably going to be the final name for it, but it's always tricky with the standards, what's going to be the final number, and I don't understand the details, but they don't want to, they want to be careful. So the final name for ECMAScript Next is probably going to be ECMAScript 6. ECMAScript Harmony is another word for upcoming versions. So it's a superset of ECMAScript Next. So uh, a few times I'm going to mention ECMAScript Next, because ECMAScript Next is going to be a very nice cleanup of the language. There are some uh, weird parts of JavaScript, and many of those are going to be cleaned up uh, via ECMAScript Next. Influences. Um, the obvious one is the syntax, and JavaScript started out as Lisp, believe it or not, and then uh, Netscape um, collaborated with Sun, and they changed the marketing, and they wanted, it to, they wanted to market it as kind of a helper for Java, which is, and the naming is unfortunate because the two languages are syntactically similar, but under the hood they are completely different. Um, so uh, the, the syntax comes from Java mostly. Uh, some of the semantics, some of the, uh, like how functions are handled, how scopes are handled, comes from Scheme, which is a list dialect, and self has, uh, brings a kind of inheritance that doesn't involve classes. So it's a purely object-based inheritance, which can be um, very nice and very neat. I encourage you to, to look up self. It's a very cool language. Uh, but they, in, in trying to bring together um, Java and self, uh, JavaScript has made things more complicated than they actually needed to be. Overview, we're going to talk about values, functions, OP. I'm going to give a few tips and then there's going to be uh, the conclusion. Uh, let's talk about values first. Uh, none of the following should be surprising to you. You should know uh, Booleans, you have true and false. Uh, numbers, and this one is surprising, there are only, there's only a single kind of number in JavaScript, and those are 64 bit floating point numbers. So you might think this might look like an integer, uh, but actually it's a, it's a floating point number. 
Um, but then again, the interesting thing is that many of the JavaScript engines internally detect whether you are working with integers uh, or floating point numbers internally, which is kind of neat. Then you have strings, and you have two kinds of uh, null values, which is also a bit uncommon, but which does have some benefits. So all other values are objects. And this in, in Java, the difference between primitives and objects is very stark. So you have a very, uh, you, you always have to be aware, for example, if you work with collections, uh, is it a primitive, should I box it, you have uh, un uh, unboxing automatically under the hood, but you have to be very conscious of whether you work with a primitive or an object. It makes a huge difference. Um, for example, you can invoke uh, methods on, on, on primitives and a lot of stuff. In JavaScript, thankfully, the difference between primitives and objects is negligible. You hardly ever notice uh, whether this, actually it's almost difficult to distinguish primitives from objects. So that's good. But every now and then it crops up and then it helps to be aware of the difference and this is where you have a head start as a, as a Java programmer because you've been trained. So let's look at uh, several kinds of objects. Um, the um, name-wise, it's a bit strange because you have like objects, objects, objects that are just objects, and then you have arrays are also objects. So it's a bit difficult to to name the things correctly. Uh, you have simple objects, and those are uh, just maps from strings to values, and you have a very neat. Uh, notation for those. Uh, an object is just a collection or a set of properties, kind of entries in the map. And every property has a name and, and a value. Uh, and then you can access it via this uh, dot notation, which should be familiar to you. Um, and you can assign to it. And there's also uh, a corresponding notation that's more along the lines of uh, of objects being a collection. Uh, you have this kind of index access with the square brackets where you can use variables to do the same thing. And you just use the string to access the property and so this line means the same as this line over here. Uh, there are a few supporting uh, functions. You can extract all the property names by object uh, dot keys, and so that's it for that. And objects play a double role. On one hand, they really are objects, so they encode behavior. Uh, on the other hand, they are a collection. So you don't have many collections at the moment in JavaScript, so uh, objects are there, and you always have to kind of hope that strings is key are going to be all right. So. Otherwise, you have to use external libraries. So Java is very nice when it comes to collection classes. Uh, arrays are objects too, um, which is kind of obvious. Uh, should be too surprising. Uh, you have this kind of square notation to uh, define and, and fill an array. Uh, you Every array has an index access via square brackets here, um, and every array has a length. So you can do a for loop over it, um, but in addition to that, the arrays have a lot of very nifty methods that allow you to iterate over the contents of an array, and that's very similar to functional programming. So you can do this is uh, for each method that iterates over each array element and you use a function and get handed the, the current element and optionally you can also leave that out an index. So you, this is a, a, a neat way of, of iterating over things. And there's several others. Um, does anyone of you uh, know Scala or a functional lang functional language in general? All right, so for that, leave that. Uh, 
Um, so um, then you have functions, and I'm going to say more about functions soon, but those are also objects. And to, to any object, you can always add and remove properties. So you can always attach stuff, which is very neat. In, in Java, you have to worry if something you have to explicitly build in extensibility for an object. With JavaScript, you always have it. You can always attach data, which is cool. Uh, then you have regular expressions built in. You have the, the nice literal syntax for a regular expression, so you don't have to worry about escaping. Um, there are uh, five, or JavaScript is a, a very broad notion for not a value. In addition to the aforementioned uh, undefined and non, you could also consider uh, the empty string kind of being uh, not a string. So the difference between undefined and null is that, uh, well, it's not really a difference, that the two are almost the same. And you have, if you start, um, and you just use a variable. Um, Uh, so if you if you just start with a variable uh, and then try to find out so the okay, right. try to find out what's in it, it's always undefined at the beginning. So this is kind of the uh, undefined is the value that uninitialized variables have, kind of like null in, in Java. Uh, if a, par a parameter is missing, you can always leave out a parameter. Uh, JavaScript doesn't check that you provide all the parameters. Missing parameters are undefined too, uh, and missing properties are undefined as well. So you, if, you, if you access and if you use a property name uh, for an object that, and the property doesn't exist, you get uh, undefined value. And now this to be used by the developer. Then you have false and not a number. A false is boolean. Not a number is, is a number. Uh, ironically, uh, so that's a number value. Um, and what all of these values have in common is that they are considered uh, falsy. So that's a very, has anyone heard the, the word falsy before? It's a, a, a JavaScript word, so it's a good one to know. Falsy means kind of like uh, that it is interpreted as false. So whenever you have an if statement like this, it checks. <coughs> whether my var has one of these values. So that's a, a very compact way of checking whether a parameter has been provided and whether a variable has a value array. So, but you have to be a tiny bit careful because uh, it can be either under, you, you can't distinguish between undefined and say the empty string. So you have to be a bit careful, but this kind of pattern is used very much in JavaScript. And because undefined is falsy too, so you use it mainly for that. So for categorizing uh, values, you have two operations, and this is unfortunately and painfully where the difference between primitives and objects becomes a bit obvious, but it's about the only place where it's obvious. Uh, if you want to categorize, if you want to find out what kind of primitive a value is, or if you want to distinguish primitives and objects. Uh, you want type of. So um, type of ABC tells you that it's a string. Uh, type of the square brackets tells you that an array is an object. And what will be a bit surprising possibly is that what will that return? This should be surprising. This is So it returns a string and it says, well, what if we've just checked here, that's a string. Uh, but then we have the following. What does it return? So, but as a, you can't completely forget about that. So you never, never ever are going to box in JavaScript. 
So you can't forget that, and you see that it's just, it's very, very different. And uh, boxing is, is, or this kind of wrapping of a, of a primitive is very important in Java, but it's not at all in JavaScript. Then you have relational operators, and the, the main takeaway here is because like less than and greater than those shouldn't be surprising. Uh, the main takeaway is that uh, you should always use the triple equals, always, always. There is a, a double equals to, but there's like series over series of articles on the internet that just uh, uh, point out weird stuff that you can do with the double equals. Don't read those articles, always use the triple equals. And there's even, uh, has anyone, uh, does anyone know the acronym uh, W, what is it? Uh, w, hang on. It's WTF uh, Jams? Has anyone seen that? So it's what the fuck JavaScript. So if, if something is strange, you're going to read what the fuck ja uh, JavaScript, and uh, on Twitter it's like this. And so if you search for that on Twitter, you're going to get uh, many nice little weird puzzles. Uh, but if you know the right rules, you can't ignore most of them. So that's kind of, uh, and that's my main advice. You have to be loosely aware that there's weird stuff out there. Uh, but if you know the right rules, you're never going uh, to get in contact with the weird stuff. So, and that's why I never use uh, the double equals. Then there's more operators. You have the typical Boolean operators. Uh, you have and and or, which um, are not, which work for any kind of value. So that's a bit surprising, and we're going to use those uh, later on. Um, then you have um, numbers and you have plus and times and so on. Well, those are really uh, the same in almost any programming language these days. Strings, you add by a plus, so that is similar to how Java does its thing. Uh, so nothing that should be too scary. Um, and now we come to the important part of this. Um, Function. Every one of you has probably already written a function, right? Who has already written a function in JavaScript? Excellent. Um, so the uh, there is a, an important difference. You have function expressions and you have function declarations. And does everyone know the difference between a statement and an expression? What is the difference? It's like a grammatical thing. So a statement is something you do. It's it's a command. Um, so if you say uh, if you start a function, write something. The first thing you're going to write is a statement. You do things. A for loop is a statement, for example. Um, but every time um, you have to provide a value, for example, as an argument to a function, it is an expression. And for example, a for loop being a statement, you can't put a for loop uh, into an argument of a function. You can't do it, well, you can't do it in functional languages, but you can't do it in Java, and you can't do it in JavaScript either. Uh, so that's the difference between the two, and it sometimes matters at strange places. Uh, here, and what we're doing here is we're working with uh, the same, kind of, we do the same thing. First, we create f via uh, a function declaration, and then we do the same by by, uh, by using a function expression. We create the value assigned to f, and the declaration basically does the same thing. So it's just two different ways of doing the same thing. Yeah, now we come to something uh, that is, um, very different from almost like any other language out there. Variables in JavaScript are function scope. So you might think that you are safe um, if you just open a square, uh, uh, a curly brace. For example, here you have an, an if statement, 
And you'd think that by opening a brace here, uh, that this variable is going to be local. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is that if you, it's already defined up here, which is weird. So you declare it down here, but you can already access it up here. So that's because the, 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 the scope, like the area, where variables exist, where they are valid, that is always the function in JavaScript at the moment. That will change soon, <coughs> thankfully. Um, so you might think that you created like inside this if statement, but actually it exists for all of the function. And you can explain it by no. You can explain it by showing that this is internally transformed into something else. So this is, the above is the same as, and what's done here is so-called hoisting. It's a, it's a declaration at the beginning, and then an assignment down there. So the var temp is split into two, the, the var part is pushed to the beginning of the function, and the assignment stays where it is. That's called hoisting. And it, it's very useful to keep that in mind. Uh, and then you come to a pattern that is used to kind of create a block. So you have this pattern, and you can simulate a block when you need one. Uh, but has anyone ever used uh, this kind of function here that invokes itself? Has anyone ever used it? Okay, those are the experts. Very good. Um, the, the, so what you do is you, you just um, basically you, you learn the pattern and then try to kind of ignore what's going on. But what you have is you create a function because a function is the only way to introduce a new area, a new private area, a new scope. Uh, so you have to create a function, and then you immediately invoke it. You immediately call it. Um, so you could also have a, a parameter here and provide a, like values for the parameter and thus introduce variables that are local to these braces here. Um, and thanks to that, temp inside the function, because that is like the the dominant scope, uh, it stays local. And if you try to access temp up here now, you get an exception, you get an error. So you've achieved the goal of, of being local. Is that surprising? Kind of should, should be okay. It's, it's, it's kind of weird. You, you use a function because it, it has truly local variables. You invoke it right away. Uh, it's really kind of negates the whole effect of, of delaying the execution. Uh, you have to surround it uh, with parents uh, because only uh, expressions can invoke themselves. So if you don't have the parents here, it, it thinks that the function is a statement. And then it's going to complain that you can't invoke yourself as a statement. But this is a detail. What, what you have to learn is just how this is written. You open your parent, uh, you have open parentheses, you have a, a closing parenthesis, and the function in the middle, you immediately invoke yourself, and you learn that pattern, you use it whenever you need, really need like local variables. Uh, then we come to optional parameters. Um, those are less fun in Java, more fun in, say, Python and some other languages. Uh, in ECMAScript Next, you will be able to declare the parameters and then declare default values for them, which is nifty. In uh, JavaScript, uh, there's yet another pattern you have to learn. Uh, and there's two ways you can do it. So, Forget that there's an equal sign here. Let's copy paste. Um, so in, in 
in JavaScript, whenever you have a function, you can evoke it with as many parameters as you, as you want to. So given this function foo, you can just invoke foo with no parameters at all, and JavaScript is not going to complain. But what will happen instead is that every parameter you left out will have the value undefined. So you can check for that. You can check, um, did the caller leave out uh, the optional parameter one, op one? Uh, and if so, if he or she left it out, uh, the value is going to be undefined. And then you can assign a, def a default value. Uh, same for op two. And there's an alternative solution that allows you to write a little less code. And here you use uh, the, uh, the OR operator, and the OR operator says that if the first one is falsy, uh, or is not falsy, then use that one. Uh, otherwise, use the second value. So, for example, what's what's going to be the result of that? Yes. Uh, what is going to be the result of that? Yes, because the end string is false. Again, uh, this is an, an object, an empty object. What is it going to be? The object. Yes. Same for an empty array, and same for any kind of object, actually. So that helps here, and it's it's not so bad. So if, if up one has a value, you use that. <coughs> one, otherwise, use the default. Um, then you have a special variable called argument, which is very curlish uh, and very much like Unix shell, shell scripting in, in some ways. And that variable is an array uh, that will always have. Um, that will always have all of the parameters, always. Like, no matter what I write up here, I could declare parameters up here, arguments down here is always going to be um, kind of an array of all, the, of all the parameters. And it's, but in addition to that, it's, it's kind of weird uh, because it's not an array. It looks like an array, but it's not, and there's like some other issues. Uh, but it allows you to work with a variable amount of parameters. And you have the, the ellipses in, in, in Java where you can have rest parameters, right? You use that for if you implement uh, string format. In, in, in Java, this is string format. Uh, so whenever you, you just need a variable amount of, of arguments, you use this uh, special variable and it has a link and index access, so you do that. Um, so the, accordingly, if you want the REST parameter uh, in Equus Connects, you're going to be able to do that, and that's like uh, JavaScript at the moment, almost. Um, and in current JavaScript, you, um, you leave out the, the REST parameter here, and you do some conversion to an array, and this is something you just have to learn and you use blindly. Uh, and then you, what you do is you copy, starting with the, the first index, you copy the arguments, and you create an array. Uh, and then you have your parameters. Next you get to OOP, the Object Oriented Programming. Um, the, a very, very nice feature in JavaScript is that you can directly work with objects. 
There are very few languages out there at the moment that allow you to do that. Most in most programs, uh, in most programming languages, if you want to create an object, you have to write a class. Uh, so that means, and the singleton pattern. Who do you know the singleton pattern? It's a it's a design pattern, and it's it's a very kind of a weird and trick to associate a class with a single instance. So, uh, and this is kind of, um, so in, in, for example, in Java, if you, if you just need a single object, you always have to write a class, and the pattern helps you uh, to make sure that things don't go wrong. What you do in, in JavaScript instead, you just directly create an object. And that's very neat for trying out things. So if there's just Jane and no one else, uh, why would you want to create a class person, for example, if it's, if it's just Jane, if it's just a, a, single, uh, a single instance? And here you yet again have the properties, you have the property name, name and you have a, a property value. Uh, as soon as a property has a function as a value, that property is called a method. And then and methods, and this is unfortunate. So you you're uh, creating a method here, and, and you're using the word function. But okay. Um, so then you invoke it by as you would in in, in Java. You just uh, call the method, and it uh, returns a string that you then print via, via console.log. Um, and the naming difference is this is called a data property, this is called a method, and both are properties. And you can always assign different values. So you have a lot of, of flexibility. You can always replace it with something else, and then it wouldn't be a method anymore. Uh, and this is the functions are do a lot of things in JavaScript. Uh, you've already seen uh, that they work as methods and as just really functions or procedures or for callbacks, for example. Um, and unfortunately, every function has a this. And normally you would think, well, this only makes sense for a method and you would be right. Um, so, um, and this is a problem whenever you nest a function and you do that a lot in JavaScript, whenever you nest a function inside a method. <coughs> so here you have a method log after, and log after would like to refer to this.name, but it does so within a function that's nested. So what you have here is the, the method log after, it makes a call to set timeout, and set timeout has two parameters. One is milliseconds, so it counts down, say, uh, 10,000 milliseconds. And once the countdown is finished, it executes uh, the, uh, the first parameter. It executes the function you hand it. Because you can do some interesting things with that. Uh, but the problem is, in this first parameter, you want to log, you want to use the name up here. But as this function down here has its own this, uh, the, the methods log after this is not accessible. And that's, that's really bad. Um, so what you do, what's a very common pattern, is to give this a different name, and then it won't be shadowed. Then it will still be accessible because it has a different name. And then you, but you have to be very careful, and even really good programmers get it wrong every now and then. And uh, thankfully, ECMAScript Next is going to fix that, too. That's just weirdness, so that's a really weird part. Um, now, so far we've only worked with single objects, and that's just nice to get experimentation going, to, to start, to, you can't just explore, you can start with single objects, and then introduce the abstractions later. You start with the concrete, and then introduce the abstract stuff, the groups, uh, later. Um, but So let's say, well, you've created Jane, and then you think about John. You want to uh, introduce John as well. 
uh, and the last thing is always go, obviously. So, um, and these do basically the same thing. So what you have here is you have two objects and they both have the same method. Um, so then you would want to want the two objects to share this kind of describe method. It's the same code, it doesn't have to be in each object. Uh, and what you do in class-based languages right now would be you create a class. And the JavaScript lets you do something similar, but it's purely object-based. You only have objects for that. You don't have classes. And what you do is, Jane and John still exist, but they refer to another object that they share. And this kind of shared object is called a prototype. What then happens is, whenever you access something in John, when you now do when you now do john.describe, for example, um, then it's going to look in, in John for the property describe, and it's not going to find it. John doesn't have a property describe. So it, it goes on to the prototype, looks there, and finds, well, cool, the, the prototype has a property describe. I'm going to use that one. And um, then I'm going to execute the, uh, this function, and this here is still John when the search started. So let's just really quickly try that out. Um, so John dot describe. <laughs> works because uh, it's and describe has a value too it's a function so the, the whole thing is a method uh, it can't find it in in John it goes on to look to to prototype and that this here is 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 John where we started the search so that allows you to that allows you to uh, share stuff. And you can imagine that there's going to be other persons, they might have a child or whatever, and the and all of these instances can have the same prototype. So you have a single prototype, uh, and the method described only exists once, while the, the instance-specific stuff, the name that is typical for the instance, that exists in each object. Um, so this is kind of, uh, you, you can't assign it that way, uh, but this is a bit non-standard, so you use something different, but just to introduce it, this is a very illustrative, a very nice way of introducing it. So you, and you wouldn't usually do that, you'd usually work with something more like a class. You'd usually work with something that's, well, the JavaScript analog of a class. And the JavaScript analog of a class is called a constructor. And yet again, a function. So a function does three things in JavaScript. It's a method, it is a really a function, and it's a constructor. It's a factory for objects. So a constructor function is a factory for objects. And here it has two parts. The function itself assigns <coughs> the instance specific parts. So every instance has something that is specific to it, and that's the name. So you assign that here, you just say this.name equals name, and stuff that is shared between the all the instances, you put down there in person.prototype. So, the, so person.prototype is actually the prototype object of all the instances. And this is a pattern you learn. This is variable, it's 
kind of ugly, unfortunately. Uh, but you learn it, you live with it, it's not too evil. Um, it's all, only when it comes to subtyping and subconstructors, the analog of subclasses, then things get more tricky. But this you can learn, you need some specific parts go into the constructor, the um, the shared parts go into the, the prototype, which becomes the prototype object, and then you're done. And the thing you create here is the same, uh, the same as before. So you, the object chain you have before, it's always the same kind of chain. It's now it's just yet another way of creating that object. So far, so good. Any, any questions? Uh, the subtyping idea, and this is where it gets a bit weird and a bit puzzly. Um, the let's say you want what you already have, or, or what we already have, or what we've already implemented, is a person. So you have an instance of person that's Jane. Its prototype is this object. Instance specific is the name. Shared between all instances is the method described. And let's say you want to create uh, a subclass, a subtype. And that subtype would be employee. The employee would have, per instance, something uh, would have in addition to what the person already has, which is name, it would additionally have a type. So Jane could be a CTO. Um, and then you, you probably want all of the methods of, of person prototype in addition to, uh, to your own methods. So you want to use person already has you, you that's what subclassing is all about. Uh, but you also want to bring your own, you also want to have your own methods. And this is how you do it. The thing is, can you tell what's going on? Try, can you figure it out? It's, it's, it's kind of a trick. Um, so what we, you use, what you used here is the object has a prototype. So what is found here is looked up here. Uh, same thing here. You have an instance, uh, a method such as describe, this is found in the instance, and then the search continues in the prototype. So that's the same. But then, the prototype has yet again a prototype. So then, if, if there's some a person specific method that employee doesn't have, it, can't, it won't find it here, and the search is going to continue here. So it's like, I can find a method here, let's search here, and then go on here. So you use this kind of, uh, you only have objects, you connect the objects via this prototype relationship, and then you connect kind of the super prototype with the sub prototype to share methods, to inherit methods. So you have two kinds of inheritance. You have, on one hand, inheritance between uh, the, the type and the instance. So an instance inherits the method described. But you also have inheritance between types. And in both cases, in, 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 Java, in, in Java, it's a different mechanism. The, this kind of instances inheriting from the type that's done by classes. And the, uh, that's the relationship between an instance and a class. But the, the mechanism of a, a, a subtype inheriting methods from a supertype that's done uh, by a class, that's a relationship between classes. And in JavaScript, it's always between objects. Uh, so this is the implementation. Uh, it's object create is a way to create a new object uh, that, whose prototype is uh, person.prototype. And this is something you probably want to look at in, in, in private. It's a bit, you can compare it with the the diagram, but this is how the diagram is implemented actually in practice if you already have the, the person type. A few 
few tips. Uh, there is a special mode in, in ECOSCOP 5 that you can switch on that won't do anything in, in older uh, JavaScript versions and that's the so-called strict mode. Uh, you, you can suggest you just look it up on the, what it does. It's, it's very useful because it performs a few more checks. It's just stricter so you get more errors reported, uh, which is always nice. Uh, then there are several tools. You have the ECOSCOP 5 shim, which gives you uh, a lot of neat functionality in all the browsers. So you are always up to the new, you're basically up to the newest version of, of ECOSCOPT in, in all the browsers. Uh, Node.js is highly recommended, especially if you want to interactively try out JavaScript. Um, and if you, well, shell scripting, I always find shell scripting incredibly painful. And with uh, Node.js, you can write your shell script, uh, shell scripts in JavaScript, so you spare some of the, the pain. In the shape of a different kind of pain. Uh, and then uh, there's <laughs> underscore that gives you a lot of nice uh, utility methods and functions. Uh, there's, but I'm just throwing out bits and pieces here, so there's nothing uh, systematic about this slide. Uh, AMD is um, a module system for browsers that gives you modularity in the browser, which is cool. And then for unit testing, I at the moment I really like uh, Mocha in conjunction with ExpectJS. And having uh, an interactive command line where you can try out things uh, is very, uh, it's, it's really good to have a JavaScript. And I always miss that a bit. In, Whenever I program in JavaScript, I really miss Eclipse. Whenever I program in Java, I miss the ability to interactively try out stuff. Uh, this brings us to the conclusion. Um, JavaScript, yes, there are quirks. It is a quirky language. I'm not, uh, I won't try to invent it in that department. Um, but what you do is, where in other languages, you learn language constructs. In JavaScript, you just learn the patterns. You just need to find a, a good book, uh, and then you uh, you just learn certain patterns, and you are fine. And the and you won't be bothered by the weird stuff. The future looks really bright. ECMAScript Next is going to be a very cool cleanup. Uh, it's going to borrow some stuff from from Python. So it's going to be a, a, a very clean, easy to use language that's going to be widely implemented. Uh, Windows 8, uh, who of you has heard of uh, Windows 8? The kind of tablet thing, Microsoft thingy, um, the nature of user interface and stuff. So they, just, uh, they kind of try to take care of tablets. It looks very interesting. Um, and they have written major, like really big applications in Windows 8 in JavaScript. Uh, in Windows 8, the App Store has been written in JavaScript. And in Windows 8, the email client has been written in JavaScript, which is amazing. Um, Qt5 uh, is a cross-platform widget toolkit. And they, uh, in, in version <coughs> 5, they're really supporting uh, JavaScript very well now. So that's yet another way that, let, or, well, that's a good way of letting you build a cross-platform uh, desktop apps in JavaScript. So it's, it's really becoming uh, very universal. You can use it on the web. Uh, you can use it uh, for desktop programming. So it's really becoming, it's not just this web niche anymore. You can use it in, in, in many contexts. So here are two links. Uh, one is uh, a blog post I've written that gives you a JavaScript overview and then further links to, to further resources if you want to learn JavaScript. Uh, and there's a, a small article that helps you to uh, gives you a few tips on how to do shell programming with Node.js, which is a, a you can just download it. It's very easy to install, uh, and then you can do shell scripting in JavaScript, and it gives you tells you what you need to know. So that's it from my part. Uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, you just don't.
C'est plus avec si elle deux si c'est si c'est égal égal c'est bizarre des fois c ça fait des choses qu'on qu comprend pas on peut l'expliquer mais c'est trop c'est moi je connais les détails mais je le, je les oublie d'accord donc c'est on peut faire des comparaisons qui, qui sont ouais qui sont bizarres donc c'est on l'oublie et on est bien <rire> Yes, yes, very good question. Good question. What's the difference? Yes. Um, <laughs> Axel, can, can you please repeat the question from the video? Yeah, sure. So the question was, if you look at the slide, um, what is the difference between declaring a method in the constructor um, and declaring or adding a method to the prototype? And it's actually it's cool that we can do both. Uh, so the difference is, if you look here, if you have the instances and that point to the that point to the prototype, you have the choice. Name is something that's instance specific. Um, but so now you have the choice: Do I want the method to be instance specific, or do you want it to be the same? Uh, do I want it to be shared between the, the prototypes? Um, so, and that means that it's going to be, is it going to be, is it really going to be in each instance, or is it just going to be in a single object? So less memory consumption. Does that make sense? So you have all the instances, and the like, the shared single object on top, which is the, the prototype shared by all the instances. And you can put stuff down in the instances and have it many times, or you can just have it a single time and, and put it up in the prototype. Does it mean if you uh, if you have the same function inside J then in the prototype when you call it, uh, which one is gonna be Very good question. The um, whatever is found first uh, wins. So the search, uh, if you look at the diagram, the, the search starts here. And for example, if you look for describe, you don't find it here, then you go on. The prototype, you find it here, you're fine, and you're satisfied. You don't. Can we think the, the prototype of just like uh, a Java interface? No, no, because the. Uh, a Java interface is uh, is just it doesn't have any content really. So it's um, it is the, the prototype possibly very very loosely related, but it's more like another object. So you have an object and then the prototype, and both are objects, and it's it's more like. Um, it's more like a, a class of a superclass. That's more similar to it. Because what you don't find in the subclass, you look up in the superclass. So that's more similar to that. Uh, I have two questions on how do you chain uh, algorithm methods to the, <coughs> the method in the superclass using the prototype uh, you can I mean, uh, if I need to. I need to go the, 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 the 
this, but yeah. let's do it. Let's do it offline. You just come to the. Uh, <laughs>